All right, guys. Another Periscope. Trying to do something a little bit different this time. And going to see... I know I'm a bit late here, by the way. I know I'm a little, a little late here. I'm going to try a different format. Because, you know, we've historically had this big... Um, you know, we had the COVID cabal. We had dating relationship Periscope. And... Trying out, you know, as we talked about before, trying out seeing if we'll be able to move it to something that's a little bit more um, focused, you could probably say. Actually, I don't want to say like focused, but also, you know, we're going to be having Q&As and we'll be able to talk about a lot of different stuff on these ones, but to have like a topic that each video revolves around. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think about that? You guys, you guys have an opinion on this? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? Um, you guys can let me know, but we're going to try it out and experiment because even though I love the kind of classification of those two things, um, you know, I think let's, let's play around with some stuff. So, um, before we jump into the, the question, which is how to break to some functional relationships, which I think is something that, you know, we're going to talk about that on the macro and the micro, we got to talk about the wine. So I was thinking about expanding this tasting, but the reality is my parents aren't here and I've already spent most of the time that they've been gone not drinking. I don't want to open four bottles. So um, right now we have Morlino Descanzano. So Morlino Descanzano, I have to be honest, I always associate Morlino Descanzano with Chianti or with Sangiovese, right? Because, well, because it's in, it's in Tuscany, but it's actually very different. So we have Chianti right over here. And then remember we have um, right here is uh, Montalcino and we have Montepulciano, right? So this is the main Tuscany area. And then you have the Super Tuscans over here on the coast, which we'll be getting to soon. But then you have right here Morlino Descanzano. It's right on the coast, but it's on a hill. But unlike down here, which uses mostly like French varietals, international varietals, Morlino Descanzano also uses... Sangiovese and has the same requirements as Sangiovese. The only difference is that they call it Morlino. So that's why it's Morlino of Scanzano, the town of Scanzano. So I'm not trying it next to a Chianti. Maybe I should do it, but I, like I said, I don't want to open too many bottles of wine. But I was curious about the organic versus unorganic. Same company. This is a Reserva 2017. This is 2018. But I was curious, is there a difference? Do they just put this on here to try to prop up their low-level wine? I don't know. But let's find out. Because I can tell you, as someone who worked in the wine industry, organic um, can mean a lot of different things. It really depends on the producer. Organic can be pretty much bullshit. It's kind of like natural, right, in the, in the supermarket. But you can see off the bat that the color is different that the, the, the organic one's a little lighter. It looks like it's it's younger. There's less oak treatment to it. Let's see. It's very bright, very fruity off the nose. So this is interesting. You know, I was th the, the wine I was going to try this next to was a Rosso de Montalcino. And, or uh, maybe it was Montepulciano. And you know, honestly, it's very similar to the ones that we had of that. Very, very light and fruity on the front end. Not too much oak on this. Super good drinking table wine. Let's try number two. More weight to it for sure. It's a, it's a little it's a little juicier. There's definitely more oak treatment. But you know, when we were doing some of the some of the Chiantis, the Chianti Classico was very complex. But when we were doing some of the Chiantis and other, you know, wines from, from this area, I was uh, surprised because they were really, really chewy. And this is not so much. So I'm trying to think, is there really a big difference between Morlino Descanzano and a lot of the Tuscan Reds? I think that the ultimate answer is no. And that you can pretty much use them interchangeably. But just know that if you want to bring a wine someplace. People know Chianti, but if you want to mix it up a little bit, you can get, remember, like a Rosso de Montepulciano, Rosso de Montalcino, but you can also get a Morlino de Scanzano. And you're pretty much all getting the same thing. You're getting, I mean, I, I haven't really noticed from this much of what I can discern as a coastal influence. Maybe it's a little cooler. What's alcohol content here? 
14.5, yeah, it didn't feel that light. So it's actually arguably heavier. So anyway, so as for the question, and then we'll go into some of the, the Q&A stuff. And you guys can feel to ask some stuff as we go through this. How to break from dysfunctional relationships, okay? And I, this was coming to mind because I think it's, it's such a big part of moving into 5D. So I don't know if maybe you've seen some of the stuff going around, like how, and actually it went around again recently, but this went out also in late fall, that a bunch of intuitives and light workers, et cetera, are going to be, who used to be very open and used to be very available for people are now pulling back holding back their gifts, right? Holding back their gifts from other people, not wanting to interact with them. And it's kind of interesting because I'm seeing this play out all the time right now. Yeah, with family members. And look, I, I want to I wanna say this stuff with a lot of love. I mean, we've all inherited some really, really serious, really, really serious um, you know, generational trauma, right? generational patterns and baggage and um i think for for those of us who have been more intuitive um star seed esque right you might say we've always found ourselves to be a little bit different in these families and you know still loving the families still being really appreciative of being in them but there's been a sense that you know there are these patterns going on and we might see these patterns and and we may try to fix the patterns and we've always tried to be there to harmonize. But that's been my experience, you know, trying to harmonize for a long period of time. Um, but I've been hearing this from a lot of people I've been working with and just kind of hearing it on the streets, like trying to go along with it or try not to create too much of a disturbance. And I think that we're at the point now where I think that's over, right? And so when we look at a macro level, you see um, all these individuals are just at the point where they're they're saying enough, and it's it's not it's not a matter of love. It's not a matter of appreciation. They're just saying enough. You know, I just don't want to participate in this anymore, and that's participating in very often things that we've talked about here, right on the COVID cabals, talking about the big picture stuff. We're not going to participate in you know fraudulent system. We're not going to we're not going to participate in any of this sort of macro bullshit anymore. Just done with it done with the psyops, done with all the uh, propaganda. But we're also done with a lot of the patterns <clears throat> and expected behavior that we have in our, you know, close-knit circles that have gone back since we were a difficult thing for everybody to deal with. And, uh, you know, and I think that we need to be very empathetic for people on the other side who may not perceive things the same way as us or not feel the same way that we do at the moment. Although I do think that people are feeling, you know, everyone feels it on a certain level. They just don't want to maybe acknowledge it because of the fear behind changing up something, even if it's broken, but it's been around for a while. So how do you deal with dysfunctional dynamics? Well, I think that the big trap that we get into is that we try to fight with people about it. And the reality is that if we've been in these dynamics, and this goes this way down to relationships, right? A pattern requires, like the Hegelian dialect, right? It requires an action and a response, right? And, and the pattern in a relationship, whether we're talking one-on-one, -on -one, whether group, whether society, doesn't matter level, it requires both sides to respond to each other in the same way. So you have the polarization dynamic that they create on a macro level in society. You have the you know, Republicans versus Democrats, left versus right. You know, and then they want people to fight against each other. They want to they want to push them against each other. And then you get to the family and it's, you know, we do things this way and I'm in charge. You're not in charge. Bullshit. And then you get down to the bottom level within individual relationships. And there's all sorts of, you know, individual baggage. Some of the things you see on the group level. The issue is when and, and it's OK to go through this as a phase, but to but to respond to this stuff from a position of aggression, right? And to be like fighting against it, wanting them to change. We want them to change. And when it comes to people we love, we want them to change. And that's totally understandable that we want them to change. Why wouldn't we want them to change? We love them. 
and we want to be with them. But the truth is that we're not able to do that. You can't argue or persuade people into changing. You can't do it. You can't respond to their rejection of you with a demand that they stop rejecting you. And we do this very often unconsciously. We don't even realize it. But this happens a lot in relationships, right? We want the other person to, we love someone and we want them, why can't you just be like this? Why can't you just accept this? Well, the reality is that they don't have to accept that. They don't have to accept you. They don't have to do anything for you. But what you need to do if they're not going to do that, and if they're not open with communicating with you about these, these issues, if they're not interested in trying to transcend the pattern themselves, you don't stop them from fighting with them. You don't do it by fighting with them. Because by fighting with them, you push them more in their corner. Fighting with them is actually safe. It's actually like a safe way of operating for them. Because they feel if you're fighting with them, right, then you're still engaged. But when you pull out of the dynamic altogether and you say, no, I'm just done. I'm not going to participate in this anymore. I don't want to participate in this anymore. I don't want to pretend to be someone I'm not. I don't want to force you to do anything when it comes to me. When you move into that space, that's when you move into like 5D, right? And what happens actually is very interesting because they are, well, no contact ever again. I don't know if it has to be no contact ever again, but it depends on what, how are they contacting you. I mean, I'm, I would love to hear from my family. You know, I would love to hear from people. I'd love to be in contact with them. But I also don't want to perpetuate a pattern, right? So my sort of feeling on it is that someone would have to be prepared to, to break the pattern. Someone would have to reach out with the intention of saying, hey, I, I see what you mean about this pattern. I don't want this pattern anymore. And, you know, presuming that there hasn't been so much violation, right, between the two of us, then that would be very welcomed. I can only speak for myself to be very welcomed. But the big thing here is, like, just f being exhausted. I mean, I think that, that really the way to describe it is that we are exhausted of repeating these same patterns over and over and over again. And you see that happen in relationships where, you know, people might, stay in the relationship a little bit longer, but they're just out of it. They're dead. And that's how it feels on a macro level right now, right? On a macro level, it feels like there's a large, like us, right? We're just, it's like, we're still in the relationship for one reason or another. But, well, gaslighting is manipulation. So if you're being gaslighted, then obviously you want to get out of that for good. I mean, if, if, Oh, you're saying if they come back and they're just gaslighting you. I think you have to use your discernment because it's possible that, you know, what is the real intention coming in? I think that it's a good rule of thumb that people need to go through some time. And so I don't really trust um, reconciliation from people if it comes too soon after the initial separation because almost always what that means is that there's some sort of sense of, you know, they feel isolated. They feel like they want to re recreate the pattern. So they're trying to rope you back in. Like you said, gaslighting, trying to gaslight you back into the pattern. You see this with, a, with someone who breaks up with you. And then like three months later, once they, I made it such a huge mistake. I want to get back together. If you do that, you're going to get fucked over every single time because they didn't learn their lesson they're simply bouncing from one emotional state to another and they're using you as a springboard for the next emotional state. They haven't learned anything on a deeper level. If they do that five years later and they reach out and they want to see you, hopefully they're not going to be too crazy about it you know, because that'll be a red flag. But if you somehow run into each other, for instance, and you start talking and then you find out what they've done and you know, how they've changed, it's possible. I mean, those are the situations I've seen where you see people get back together. It happens very organically. It's almost like the people have had to deal with some, they were meant to be together, but they had to deal with their issues on their own before they could be together. Where some people are together, I would say most people um, 
well, at least to get together at first and stay together are together because they have to work out their issues with each other and then they finish it and, and things are good. Sometimes, I mean, they get divorced, right? But so anyway, the, but the, the point of all this stuff is that this sort of, okay, I refuse to hold on to this dynamic and I'm going to, to take my leave of it. What this does is so powerful because it throws them off completely. It throws them off completely. And I'm not saying that that's the intention to do that. It's just a reality. I'm explaining the phenomenon. You do this for yourself. You do this because you have chosen to no longer participate. But when you stop participating, you take away part of the energy structure that maintains the polarization. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, I think a lot of people who feel, um, you know, alienated from their respective groups are, are in some ways also linchpins of those groups because they add a different energy to it and people tend to ping off of them because doing that gives the other people some sense of, you know, they're looking for a polarity. And so by removing yourself from it, you leave, you leave the, the energetic state kind of lower. And then that gives people an opportunity maybe to, how do I put this? It, 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 it gives a wake up call for people. Let's put it that way. It, it, it could signal to people, Hey, wait a minute. Maybe this pattern is a problem. Maybe we do need to change this stuff. But it's not your responsibility to solve that. And I think that where we're going right now is that we want to seek out connections with people who we feel accept us for who we are. That there's no sort of like, like the way I've seen the millennial generation in general, although obviously specific people more than others, specific groups, you know, the star seed sort of thing, is that we are here. We are here to heal a lot of this generational trauma. A lot of older generations will think of us as being kind of ridiculous and silly. But I think it's, but the reality is that they're blind to the problems. They, they might see us as idealists. But I think idealism isn't really a fair way to put it exactly. I mean, there is some idealism, sure. But the bigger point of it is that, hey, look, really don't like these patterns we just don't like these patterns we don't want these patterns anymore we want something different we want a different kind of relationship we want to work differently right this is one of the things with covid as a result of covid a lot of people i mean a lot of people have been screwed with work but other people have experienced this sort of quasi you know digital nomad experience that people 10 years earlier were doing and so i want you guys to understand the energetic structure here because, you know, we can talk about all sorts of things that are going on in the macro. We can talk about, you know, we can, we can talk about how, okay, is Biden really in the White House? You know, is it Castle Rock Studios? What's going on here? You know, what's going on with Air Force One? We can talk about all those different things, right? We can mention all those different things, which may or may not be true. I don't know if they're true or not. But what we understand at the end of all this stuff is that there has been an energy building for a very long time that's been rejecting a control structure. You can argue that that the millennial generation, what people, what you know, the the boomers were criticizing us because, oh, the, you know, they won't work hard. I don't think that's really fair when I reflect on it. I mean, there's some of it, sure, but a lot of it is really that they don't want to work in a control structure. That's it. They don't want to work in a control structure. They don't like the structure in place and they don't want to put in their time. They don't want to be in 3D. Whereas the boomer's like, well, I put it, I put my time in. It's like, yeah, we don't want to put our time in with that. A lot of us, I mean, did anyway, but we, we don't want to do it for our whole lives. We want out. We want out. And it's not a violent thing at all. It's just simply we don't want to participate. We refuse to comply with the entire structure. And, that, and that's occurring with relationships as well. So on a micro level, people who have been in relationships for a very long period of time, you know, they've been, you know, fighting's good because fighting can, can alchemize, right? They can bring the other person up out of the dynamic if you fight. But at a certain point, you know, you do, this is the, this is the levels. I'm going to tell you guys, this is the levels, okay? 
Level one, refuse to acknowledge the problems that exist. Okay, that's level one. And that's avoidant relationships, and they're terrible. These people have awful relationships, and the reality is that unless... I'm going to have to get out of here soon with the baby. Unless they, they deal with this stuff, everything's going to be completely stagnant and nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to change whatsoever in their lives. There's not going to be any passion. Sex will barely be existent. Kind of just going through the motions, right? Maybe there will be even sex, actually. In some younger relationships, there will be sex. But there's not going to be any depth, okay? You see a lot of these relationships are high school relationships, they start off like that. There's not really good communication channels. Then you move towards fighting. Fighting is actually very good because fighting can, brings a, the energy up from that lower state. It brings you to a potential where you guys can fight and then maybe you can reconcile. Maybe you can deal with these issues. Maybe you can transcend them. And maybe you can go to a direction where you get away from all this low vibration shit. But the reality is that if you fight and there's no response, there's no answer, the other person doesn't engage with you like that, you tell them how you feel, they don't really care, they don't really respond to it, then that's when it, you hit detachment. That's when you hit leaving. You leave the situation. You leave the relationship. And people talk about that on the manosphere a lot, but as you said, you know, Romeo, Thomas Sheridan advocates parallel society. That's where we're going right now. We're going that way. And, the, and the, what happens when that occurs is that that breaks the matrix. That breaks the matrix because if people refuse to participate in the old control structures, they collapse. I'm going to close with this because I have so many emails that I'm writing right now. I don't want to cover this topic in an email. I saw Varsity Blues during the Super Bowl. I didn't watch the Super Bowl. Didn't feel any energy behind it. Didn't want to watch it, even with Brady. I watched Varsity Blues. And if you guys haven't seen Varsity Blues, definitely watch it. But one of the big things in Varsity Blues is the coach. Okay, the coach is played by John Voigt, I believe, and he's a classic control structure hierarchy. He abuses the players, uses them, discards them, and he has all this power. No one can say everything. Everybody's miserable under him, but no one can say anything. And then there's a catalyst moment. There's a catalyst moment, and then you know, Mox Moxon, the quarterback, the new you know he was a backup quarterback, now the current quarterback. He stops the coach from doing like. A cruelty to another player, basically. And the whole team, you know, I don't want to ruin the whole thing, but the point is that everyone alchemizes. And, and just like that, the control structure has no power. It's over. It ends. Just like that, it ends. And so you have the situation where the control structure had all the power because everybody was still afraid of it. And then it was like, you know what? I am no longer afraid of this. And I'm going to opt out. I will not play. If you do this, I won't play. And the game ends. And then suddenly he's like, all right, we got to go. We got to go do this stuff. You know, we got to, all right, forget it. I'll do it your way. No, we don't want you anymore. We're done. We're going to do it our way. We're going to play the game our way. And if there's nothing at all about it that's violent, there's nothing about it that's aggressive. It's just simply, I refuse to engage with your bullshit. I refuse to engage with your bullshit. And that happens on a micro level and on a macro level. So guys, that's the lesson today. Dealing with dysfunctional relationships, you know, there's that famous movie, the only way to win the game is not to play. And that's the way it is. Do not play the game. So I will see you guys later. I got to run. I got a baby to deal with. It's my turn. I'll see ya.